Martin Krieger has a doctorate in physics, yet he has ranged widely intellectually, spending most of his life teaching in public policy schools and urban planning programs. His work has focused on mathematical models of cities, ecological issues of design, the notion of uncertainty, and documenting urban phenomenon. He has extensively documented life in Los Angeles by photographing housing, infrastructure, including nearly every Los Angeles Department of Water and Power Electrical Station, faith organizations, traffic and street life, commercial strips and ethnic markets, and transit and bus riders. His collection is housed in the Regional History Archives of USC Libraries and includes tens of thousands of images and hundreds of oral recordings. Martin Krieger, documenting the ever-changing landscape of the city. Great. Okay, can the panel join me please? So we've got some notable participants as well around the issues associated with some of the work that, that Martin has done. Um, we have uh, Greg Heise, Meredith Drake, Raytan? Uh, Wrighton, okay, and uh, Jonathan Chrisman. Uh, Greg Heiss is Professor Emeritus at University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, and studies metropolitan economies uh, and politics of land use in order to better understand the social life of cities. Um, he is author, co-author, uh, or co-editor of five books, uh, one of which has received the Spiro Kostoff book, from the, uh, book Prize from the Society of Architectural Historians and the Pfluger Award from the Historical Society of Southern California. Uh, in addition, he's published more than 25 articles dealing with residential and industrial development, municipal enterprise, regions and regionalism, and architecture as state building. Uh, in 2011, he received uh, the uh, Lawrence Gherkins Prize from the Society for American City and Regional Planning History uh, to acknowledge his sustained teaching excellence and educational leadership. Meredith is an associate dean in the graduate school at the University of Southern California and an adjunct professor at USC Price, where she teaches classes on planning history, urban design, and planning theory. She also writes for a KCET series on Lost LA. I don't know if you have seen it. I've actually seen it all, and I love it. It's fantastic. Um, she uses uh, mundane decisions that define the look and feel of LA streets to talk about the long history of the city as a planned environment. Uh, she has a PhD and master's from USC Price. Jonathan Chrisman is an artist and urban scholar whose work considers the intersections between culture, politics, and place. He's currently assistant professor of public and applied humanities at the University of Arizona. Uh, his book, Urban Humanities, which stakes out new interdisciplinary domain for the humanities, will be published in 2020 by uh, uh, MIT Press. Uh, he was formerly the founding director and core faculty for the UCLA Urban Humanities Initiative and was research affiliate with uh, Annette's Slab um, uh, group, where he worked with Annette Kim. He holds a PhD in urban planning and development from the University of Southern California. Kind of a trend developing here, isn't there? Yes. So thank you very much, panel. Please lead us off. <clears throat> Okay, we got around the uh, too much reading issue by assigning something that has the same title, but it's a book and an article. So the article is from Science, uh, Martin's uh, first piece, I believe, uh, from 1974, and then the book is What's Wrong with Plastic Trees as well. And you're gonna start seeing connections here across the, the panels, which I think is important, but Wicked Problems is one of these, as is environment and environmental movement. Um, so I'm gonna begin in the recent past, as a historian, why not? Uh, when Martin was producing an essay that became What's Wrong with Plastic Trees, if you see the uh, little author bio at the bottom of the, of, the, of the page there, he was a research planner affiliated with the Institute for Urban and Regional Development at UC Berkeley. Um, so he's in Worcester Hall with, with planners, architects, and others. But he's working on soft funds from a Beatrice Farron fund for landscape architecture. Uh, and you begin to see some street crossing here uh, early on. He's, in a, he's an apprentice scholar. He's projecting a career trajectory. And he's written about this in this how-to survival guide. Um, but what he suggests is that all scholars should build depth and try lots of topics. Uh, and so that's good, good strategy for students or a faculty member, but it's also terribly daunting. Uh, Martin talks about a disciplinary street in the survival guide, and he's someone who's crossing the street all the time. He's a jaywalker, if nothing else. So few, but few scholars are, are as adept at doing this um, as Martin. 
He's already uh, here in 1974, 1975 or so, up crossed from the lab, from the physics lab to the design studio. These are two different worlds, uh, and from particle physics to plastic trees. Um, regardless of where you are in your, in your career arc, he tells us it's good to, to justify your work. And so I came up with a rubric years ago that I share particularly with undergraduates about how to, how to create a, a, an abstract for your research project. I am studying X in order to understand Y uh, that we might do Z, right? So imagine Martin uh, at the proverbial water cooler with the, the faculty in landscape architecture at CED um, answering these kinds of questions. Well, I'm studying design methods as an analog of systems of system science. Um, OK, that sounds great. In order to understand, as he tells us in his subtitle, the economic, social, and political rationales for preserving the natural environments, not a small topic, um, that we might develop practical guides for right action. Um, did I mention, Martin might have said, that the focus is artifice and replication, and the case is plastic trees? What's wrong with this plan? Right? And he intends to actually submit it to science, um, which is, which is a, a, to talk about a high-ranked journal, uh, this is about as high as they get. And it's usually the last word for something rather than the first word. Um, so you know, it seems like much, uh, there's much to, to, to question here. Um, there are labs, though, by the way, in CED. Uh, this, is, this is nerd culture from 1970 or so, uh, Peter Bosselman's simulation lab. Right? Uh, this looks very low-tech to us. Right, we, we do all this uh, virtually now, um, but literally a 3D model with a camera that goes along this, uh, 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 the street to, to imagine what the street life would be like. Um, so what I'm trying to suggest here with, with, the, with the reference to IURD and, and, and CED in Berkeley is an institutional setting, and these institutional settings are important for understanding the work that we do. Um, in essence, who are you in conversation with? And the conversation takes different, it takes different forms. There's a conversation of scholarship, but there's also the conversation around the water cooler. And Tritipin mentioned this um, earlier as well. So we need to think about the intellectual fields that Martin is beginning to work in. Um, and what, what we first have to note about Martin is that he has an, an unerring, uh, almost uncanny ability to identify the key works. Um, so we might be talking about regional economies. Two weeks later, Martin will come back and tell me about Bill Cronin's Nature's Metropolis. Right? It means it just goes right to the, right to the key text. Um, urban form, two volumes of cost offs the city shaped and the city assembled. Uh, regional economies, Chandler and others. Right? He, it just, he can find the key text uh, in, in, in any field, and that allows him to then create a, a kind of scaffold um, for knowledge. Well, the citations in the science essay trace the route of a physicist going through the literatures associated with the humanities. Um, so he has to deal with things like aesthetic issues and formal analysis. He finds George Kubler. He wants to talk about theories of right action and how to create a just society. John Rawls. Uh, he, he needs to think about the preservation-conservation dichotomy and think about ideas of wilderness. Roderick Nash. I mean, this, these are older texts, but they're the key texts at that moment in time. The last footnote from the science essay acknowledges literal conversations. Who's around the water cooler? Dora Crouch, Garrett Ekbo, Richard Meyer. It's a really interesting time to be, a, to be in CED, uh, the College of Environmental Design. Um, Richard Meyer, just for example, um, was, a, um, excuse me, uh, was a chemist who crossed the street into systems theory. Uh, so he and Martin have something in, in, in common here. He was a planner. He was an urbanist. He was also a futurist. I, as a historian, I love the idea that you could be a futurist. Uh, but, but this is how Meyer sees himself. What's he publishing? Well, just in the years in Martin's at IURD, he publishes Designing Urban Systems in 1972, an article. The Future of Design Professions in 1974, so the design theory and design methods is important in part of this conversation, and a book, Planning for an Urban World, The Design of Resource Conserving Cities. Right? These are all things that, that are, uh, to go back to Dan, uh, or Jack's point, these are things that are still current today. How do you make a world uh, fit and right? How do you do this in thinking about systems, global cities, and sustainability? Well, the theory and, and method faculty um, conversing about design in CED um, were also talking about wicked problems. Not only were they talking about it, they were the people who started the conversation. Horst Riddle, Mel Weber, C. West Churchman, this is where the idea of wicked problems comes from. And, and here we are talking about the, you know, these seemingly intractable uh, uh, challenges today. Well, CED scholars and practitioners were articul articulating a new field what they talked about is environmental design. And here also, uh, apropos price, uh, the three fields couldn't decide what to call themselves. They came up with a name that nobody liked. 
And that's how they, that's how they solved it. They fought long and hard around this. Well, methods is, is one strand of a college-wide discourse uh, at UCB uh, in the 1970s. Um, nature preservation uh, was a second. Um, so when we think about nature preservation, here we have our a tree hugger on the left. Um, that what people are talking about are in, intact ecologies that ought to be kept as such. Um, tree huggers were an inspiration for the ecology movement, which we've been hearing about in terms of Dan's work. Um, and 1970 is the first Earth Day. Right, so all this is, is sort of percolating around uh, in Berkeley um, as well. Uh, 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 in terms of the, the social movement, um, the environmentalists are looking for a program, they're looking for politics, they're looking for policies uh, that, that might uh, allow one to make a better world, a more sustainable, more just world. But the emphasis here um, is less on systems and more on small scale individual action. Well, how do people respond to what's wrong with plastic trees with the question mark? Um, well, uh, one uh, reviewer uh, writing in the bulletin of the Ecological Society uh, wrote the quote, um, or he was a botanist, and he wrote, and quote, that his colleagues should read plastic trees for its glimpse into a nightmare of technical planning for people and nature. The plastic tree, he wrote, is devoid of purpose. I'm the author, a biological innocent, propounding a bad fairy tale. The essay made evidence that science, this again is the reviewer, the essay made evidence that science had lost its way. It's now become a confused journal. All this based on Martin's plastic trees. Why concern yourself with extinction, the reviewer said, when substitution is a viable alternative. Um, so here's our plastic trees, the cell tower, the palm tree, right? The palm tree is considered to be endemic to Southern California. It's not, right? It's second nature. It's, it's the symbol you know, for, the, for the city's nature, but it's, but, it's, but it's not. And here they are planting a set of palm trees along Wilshire Boulevard. Well, 46 uh, years on, um, readers might be more sanguine about uh, Martin's claims. Uh, the thesis was a pro uh, provocation then, but it's accepted wisdom now. There's been a paradigm shift over the course of two, two decades, and Cronin's, uh, William Cronin's part of this as well. His classic essay from 1995, What's, uh, The Trouble with Wilderness, um, talks about precisely this dichotomy that people have set up between preservation and conservation, between authentic and, and inauthentic, um, and reveals this to be uh, a shimmer of. Well, Martin considers the science essay a home run article. That's how he talks about it in the survival guide. It's probably the only sports metaphor or an analogy I've ever heard Martin use. Um, but he returns to carry it forward. He returns to the field 20 years later and publishes a book by the same title. Um, the nature of the revision is, is evident in the subtitle. Uh, 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 the article essay talked about the ecology movement and the competition for resources. The book is about design, production, and resource consumption. Well, time hadn't diminished Martin's proclivity for large scale and, and, and long time frames. Uh, the book begins with the, 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 the obvious starting point. After the Big Bang, the universe and its quark gluon plasma rapidly cooled down. As it did, elementary particles appeared or froze out in their current varieties. Eventually, the stars formed. This is the long fetch of history. <laughs> One ten millionth of a second after the Big Bang. And he brings it forward uh, uh, to the Rainforest Cafe. Um, so you know, no fear in terms of time uh, and, and no fear in terms of, of continuity um, as well. Um, the more recent time, the Anthropocene uh, is, is a world that we live in uh, that's a design world. Um, we redesign what's already been composed. There is no more first nature. It's all second nature. And so we need to think about um, uh, about this in new ways. Um, we plan, we, we write policies, uh, we tinker, we, we satisfy. As Martin says, we, we find the good versus the cost of the search for the best. Well, why then do plastic trees continue to offend? Uh, and here's, here's the tree is seen by. Right? These are all these different views of, and Martin would be over here, <laughs> the plastic tree. So why, why does the plastic tree, uh, tree still offend? Well, the, I'm gonna call these folks the authenticist, um, uh, assert, that the, assert the superiority of the real, uh, the genuine, as opposed to the, to the fake and the ersatz. Uh, the, there's the, the replica is, is, is impoverished in terms of the original. Um, and these are people, again, who, who equate authenticity with endemicity. Well, the, artifi the artifi artificer excuse me, um, is producing a representation of a thing, the ersatz. Um, so, so this is a dichotomy in, in the way we typically look at the world. But what if? We granted the artificer's artifacts the status of authenticity. Uh, the, the, the plastic tree, Martin tells us, is nature abstracted to human interest, right? It can serve as a windbreak. 
It can survive in a median. Right? It, has, it has value. One finds, uh, we can think of analogous examples from all, all aspects of life. AstroTurf, uh, Beyond Burger. It sizzles and smells like beef, right? But it's not authentic, but I still enjoy it. Um, the theme re retail has been mentioned already. One Rodeo, uh, Alvera Street. Uh, these are all examples of, of the Arasats. Well, if the Arasats was a country, Las Vegas would be its capital. It's a quintessentially inauthentic place, right? I was commuting by bus one evening, a Sunday evening, from the airport to my house a couple of years ago, and I noticed a crowd around New York, New York. And it's not as if there aren't usually crowds on the strip, but it was a bigger than usual crowd. They seemed to be doing something different. What they were doing was commemorating 9-11, right? So here's a, here's a view of New York, New York, with its Arasats, you know, all the buildings in New York uh, in, in 10 feet or so. Um, but here's a photograph showing uh, the T-shirts of the various fire units, right, being commemorated along, uh, along the strip. Um, so the bus crosses the strip. I see these people congregating. Um, and, and, and then I realize, aha, it's 9-11, right? Well, the authenticist would dismiss this as imitation. It's unsatisfactory. It's a substitute for the real thing. You really ought to be in New York, right? Um, but it actually becomes a tradition. For a number of years, until MGM repurposed the site for retail, um, people gathered there every September 11th and commemorated uh, 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 the, the, the events, right? Um, so not only that, but now it's, it's no longer uh, happening every year, but the artifacts, the ephemera from that event are now housed in the special collections at the UNLV library, right? Um, so now scholars can go and study, uh, study this uh, uh, resource. Well, it, well, all this requires us to rethink the, the easy uh, object replica dichotomy. New York, New York is, is, a, is a clearly, at least in my mind, an appropriate site for commemoration. Um, and it, and it, this reminds us that, that the intent for the site, by the planner's point of view, was one thing, but the way people actually use it is yet another. So Martin reminds us that contingency is always co-present with intention. Planning, in other words, is an art of making the contingent appear inevitable. And, and all of these insights, or many of these insights, come from Martin's work, um, which has been uh, absolutely uh, essential for my thinking, uh, particularly in projects like parks, playground, and beaches. Well, if all things are authentic, i.e. genuine, um, does the concept itself lose value? And what about the whole idea of, of in inauthenticity um, as well? In essence, how real is the real, Martin asks us, and could perhaps an educable machine, and here some of you future-focused folk might be thinking about AI, artificial intelligence, could an educable machine generate expert knowledge to address these kinds of wicked problems, these large-scale problems? <laughs> well, the scope, scale, and complexity of the challenges and enterprises that face us uh, haven't gotten uh, any smaller. In fact, they continue to expand, whether it be transporting goods, healthcare for all, open access housing, Right? Uh, these are big problems, and they don't come up, or we can't come up with easy solutions. So error, defects, accidents, all is intrinsic when we work at grand scales. Well, members of the Price School um, seek to make the world more equitable, more sustainable, more resilient, and more just. These are the values that are espoused in the school's mission statement. The faculty we commend today have been models for right action. Uh, generations of students and, and colleagues have benefited from uh, their models. We know they'll continue to do the good work and advice after they set down the chalk for a final time. Thank you. Hello, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm particularly delighted to speak with this looking over my shoulder for the whole time. I think that is just lovely. So, um, I'm happy to be part of this gathering, and my contribution to the discussion is to talk and to link um, Martin's research with his pedagogy. Martin may not actually remember this, but I was um, a student in his class my very first year as an MPL at the Price School um, <clears throat> 20 so years ago, um, and one of the first assignments that he gave was um, we were asked to document one of LA's long boulevards, so a Figueroa or a Sunset uh, or an Olympic. And taken seriously, and I was very, very, very serious, um, this was a thought-provoking task. I wasn't really new to LA, but as I worked on that assignment, I noticed things for the first time. 
the widths of the street, the street canopy uh, trees, where the shops ended and the houses began. And um, what Martin was doing with this assignment was encouraging us to learn how to see. And not to learn how to look, but how to see. And this is a distinction that um, has interested scholars from a variety of disciplines um, and many of the people in this room. Um, and as the art historian John Berger wrote, seeing establishes our place in the surrounding world. But Berger also reminded us that the relationship between what we see and what we know is never settled. It's not a fixed term. So for me, this is part of the challenge of us as scholars. We can all look, but can we see? And fundamentally, can we bring our knowledge and understanding to change the world and to change the pictures? And I think Martin's work has helped us to do this in a couple of different ways. So in What's Wrong with Plastic Trees, he actually starts with a great quote from Ronald Reagan. And the quote is, a tree is a tree. How many more redwoods do you need to look at? <laughs> Clearly, here is a man who has not learned how to see. And in this respect, Reagan stands as a proxy for all of us who might be blind to larger meanings or social forces that guide our actions. And so Martin asks us to think more deeply about the natural environment and what we value. Should we see Niagara Falls? How should we see Niagara Falls? Is it a monument, an event, a show to be directed by experts? As individuals and as a society, we've um, different responses to that question, but as scholars of policy and planning, we have an obligation to weigh alternatives. Analysis is good, but to what end? So one might say that plastic trees are okay, but what about plastic people? I know we're in LA, but I don't know if you saw the other day in the news, they were talking about a new company whose business model is to quote, digitally uh, resurrect actors. And their first feature film will include James Dean, 65 years after his death, um, through CGI restoration. And I'm reminded of that great um, Jeff Goldblum meme, who, quoting, it's in Jurassic Park, and he says something like, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. <laughs> and I think Martin's work over the years has demanded an answer to these kinds of questions. And so switching from that early work, I also wanted to suggest that another way that Martin has asked us to see through, uh, is to see is through his photographs. And in these images, he's captured the mundane, everyday world, but also the processes behind it. We see women praying in storefront churches, people working in factories, the facades of all of the buildings constructed for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, and each of these photographs is part of a series, and now, as they're preserved in the archives, they serve as evidence of larger systems of thought. <coughs> so they're evidence of policy choices, and I can imagine future historians poring over those photographs in the same way that I'm hoping to find 100 years ago of older photographs, looking for clues about our larger systems of thought. So Martin was one of many uh, prize faculty who taught me how to see, many of them in this room. I've returned repeatedly to that first assignment. Um, it's become a standard feature of my own classes. And as we move forward, I hope we think of this deeply ethical engagement with the seen, everyday world, and I hope that remains a feature of our work at Price. Thanks. Okay, so just since we're on the topic of the, um, of the images, uh, I wanted to throw up one of, uh, one of Martin's kind of collages, what he refers to as urban tomographies, which references, of course, uh, the sort of medical imaging of these kind of serial images, um, like a sort of a CAT scan where you take, uh, you know, these multiple 2D uh, uh, scans, and it's only through an aggregate that you actually get kind of a representation of the whole. And I think that's a really beautiful way to understand how photography can work in interpreting the city, that the city cannot be captured in a single image. Uh, but it requires this sort of serial imaging to kind of understand what's going on. And I think they're also incredibly beautiful um, representations, you know, in, in the lineage of Ed Ruscha and Robert Flick and others, um, that, that they're just really incredible, both works of art um, and uh, kind of scholarly interrogations of the city. Um, so 
Uh, so I'm a recent graduate of the PhD program in Price. Um, and I actually never uh, really interacted much with Martin. I didn't, uh, wasn't, didn't have the privilege of being in one of your classes. Um, so most of what I know uh, is through Martin's writings. And of course, we've been talking about uh, plastic trees. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I've learned a lot through reading uh, his scholarly articles. Um, uh, there are a couple themes, though, that pop up um, in Plastic Trees and, and many of his other works, uh, these sort of uh, calls to uh, sort of basic values around social justice, um, around putting people first, um, that also surfaced in some of his other writings um, that, that have actually been, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, more influential than I think you think, um, which are the, the emails that he would periodically send out to uh, the listserv um, in price. And so, uh, I just kind of collected a few short uh, snippets um, from some of those emails, and I think these sort of reveal uh, a, a similar attitude that you find in his scholarly writing, um, in, in his sort of uh, more colloquial writing. Uh, again, a kind of um, uh, putting value on these, these sort of uh, fundamental values, putting people first, and also this incredibly uh, sort of capacious uh, uh, ability to um, uh, interrogate the world around him and kind of appreciate um, things from uh, from kind of wide eyes. Um, and, you know, I find myself now in uh, it's called the Department of Public and Applied Humanities, um, and it's the type of place that I think Martin would fit right in because it has uh, a sort of uh, mix of people who are always uh, you know jaywalking, um, as it were. So here are just a few of the uh, snippets from the emails. Um, August 10, 2016. I'm available for mentoring for doctoral students. My goal is to help you focus your work, get done, find a position, and thrive. November 15, 2016. There has been much talk about transit-oriented development. I thought it might be useful to examine what actually takes place, and so I visited the ends of the lines of the New York City subway system and photographed the neighborhoods. It comes to about 5,300 images. November 18, 2016. Our academic positions are great privileges. Let us take advantage of them. It may be effectively entrepreneurial to organize stuff, edit volumes, publish lots of articles, but if you want to make a contribution that will be recognized over the long run, that may not be the way to go. November 26, 2016. Make sure the title gives away the whole story. Cute is nice, but substantive is better. A typical mistaken title might be, Whose Ox is Gored? A Study in Academic Committee Meetings. <laughs> when the right title is Passive Aggressive Behavior in University Committee Meetings. <laughs> uh, December 29, 2016. It was said of, uh, said of Feynman that he was another Dirac, but human. December 29, 2016. Even the notion of presenting chocolates in a fancy box, a ballotine, was an invention by Godiva, and the praline with soft fruit or cream in the center, Newhouse, was originally intended as a way of making pharmaceuticals more palatable. October 6, 2017. Most of my books will be available gratis. The books cover a rather wide range. October 9, 2017. As long as I have been involved with planning and policy schools, now almost 50 years, there have been two pervasive themes, inequality slash empowerment and efficiency slash fairness. October 23, 2017. I ought to have attached a montage of my photographic work in the last 10 days. It is here. I think it might be actually this one that's up on the, on the screen. Uh, June 21, 2018. My point here is that we might want to think of the many questions we ask in Price Scholarship from other perspectives than the ones we take as canonical. Uh, canonical. Feminist, black, gay, Hispanic, Asian American, et cetera, studies uh, may be very suggestive not to speak of perspectives that focus on children or the disabled. And this is for the whole policy arena, not just specific parts. June 29, 2018. I've written on the probability of doom and on predicting such, indicating the difficulty of doing so in a reliable way. The only credible doom stories are in the realm of religion, but there the argument is from authority in a sacred text. July 23, 2018. I bumped into a new book by Errol Morris, the documentary filmmaker, called The Ashtray. The Ashtray refers to an ashtray that Kuhn threw at Morris when he was a Princeton graduate student in history and philosophy of science. Kuhn then smoked six to seven packs of cigarettes a day, it seemed. October 11, 2018. Sometimes we tell ourselves, if it was good enough for me, it is good enough for our students and children. This is called internalization of the aggressor. 
It was not good enough for me, and in any case, it surely is not good enough for my students and the next generation. Make sure you are the teachers you wish you had. November 9, 2018. Space and time are to be understood not as being apart from us, but as being part of our world. Space is the possibility of separation. Time is the possibility of causation and sequence, as in Kant. So that's just sort of like a little, you know, I'm sure there are many emails that came before my time at Price, um, but I think those just sort of give a sense of, of Martin as a kind of, uh, a kind of humanist um, in the most uh, uh, sort of capacious and generous understanding of the world, someone who put people first um, and was always concerned um, about uh, uh, their sort of central role in all of the work and scholarship that he did, including uh, in the emails that he sent out uh, to us students. So thank you. Uh, let's uh, thank the panel again for all their wonderful remarks. And thank you, Martin. Uh, we all benefit, obviously, from your scholarship, from your visualization, from your oral work that you've done, and from your many uh, uh, words of advice in the emails that you've sent to all of us. So we appreciate that. Um, I would kind of interrupt our program here just a moment because uh, we have uh, a guest here, our, our new provost, uh, Charles Chip Zukowski has arrived, and I'd like to give him a chance to say a few words. Um, although uh, Dr. Zukowski was appointed to this position on October 1, he was formally installed as provost only yesterday, and I got to hear his uh, great speech on his vision for the future of USC. And so we're really delighted that he's greeting us here today, I assume as one of your first official duties after having been uh, <laughs> formally inaugurated. Uh, our prior provost um, never wanted me to give any introductions. He just wanted to say, and here's the provost. But in our, this case, because uh, Chip is new, I'd like to just say a few words about his background and importance to the university. Uh, you know, he's the provost and senior vice president for academic affairs, which I think most of you realize is the second ranking person behind the president uh, in the leadership of the university, so a really significant position. Um, he's an accomplished higher education leader, but he's also a very well-known international and renowned scholar, uh, which is critical for the provost position because it's really, he is, the, the provost is the key person that sets the standards and the vision for what academia, what the academic part of the university should be. So he earned his PhD in chemical engineering uh, from Princeton University and his bachelor's degree from Reed College. The early part of his academic career was actually spent at the University of Illinois. Uh, I, it turns out, Chip may not know this, but I was actually at the University of Illinois uh, during that same period, or at least part of it. Uh, and we overlapped, I think, for a, a few years. We didn't actually meet. I don't think we were there, but there must have been something drawing us both west. <laughs> Mountains, you know, ocean, uh, beautiful weather, things like that. Uh, but prior to coming to USC, he was, he was provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at the University of Buffalo, where he really led the university to a, a very impressive increase in graduation rates which is a hugely important thing for us as well, and a reputation, academic reputation, for, as a national public research university. In addition, he, and this is very important, he expanded the diversity of the student body and overhauled the school's general, general education curriculum. He also has a significant global experience. You know, we're seeking to be a global public policy school and university. Uh, he was in Singapore, where he spent six years as the chair of the Science and Engineering Research Council of the Academy for Science, Technology, and Research. And I'm really uh, looking forward to working together with Chip as we build the future of USC and with all of you as well. And I'm really eager to acquaint him with the Price School, uh, particularly its mission and its values, uh, which I think uh, we may have something in common here. Uh, I was reading your blog for the Veterans Day. And it was meaningful to, to me to learn uh, about your family's commitment to service, uh, including uh, your father's service as a flight surgeon uh, during World War II. And I really appreciate hearing how your family's culture of service has also influenced your, your own life. Uh, public service is integral to the Price School. 
uh, including the fact that we house the ROTC program here at the school. And this symposium today honors our 90-year history of training uh, public servants, uh, both in planning and policy and, and management. Uh, we're really grateful for Chip to take this time and join us on this special occasion in which we are honoring uh, four really exceptional uh, faculty members who are retiring. And it, this is a very important pro uh, appropriate occasion for the provost to join us. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Chip Zukoski. Well, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm um, very excited to be um, at USC. And uh, when I had the invitation to come and speak to you, I, I jumped at it because I, am only, I have only been here for five weeks. And so I'm getting, I had to be walked over. I didn't know where this conference room was, OK? I, um, so I, I, I'm glad to be here with you as you celebrate 90 years. It's a, it's a wonderful thing um, to be part of a school that has had such influence um, uh, in the local community and around the world for almost 100 years. I mean, it's, it's it, it, congratulations to you all. Um, it, you, this is a, a remarkable school. You know, I mean, with just the comments that I've been hearing, it's, it's very clear, um, uh, I'll just quote Meredith, about um, looking um, and not seeing. And um, to have, uh, we want to actually look and see, but even when we see, uh, I'm convinced that we don't necessarily understand. And what's wonderful about um, universities is we can actually see and then continuously retune what we think about that. And that's what great policy schools do, is that the, the issues that were brought up about um, understanding um, uh, race and gender and its influence on um, policy, I'm just reminded of um, the effect of freeways in the 1960s. Somebody thought that putting freeways through cities was a great idea, okay? And that was the policy. It was fabulous, okay? And then you see the same things 10, 20 years later and you understand that that's redlining and that's breaking up neighborhoods and it's destroying the cities that we live in. And that, that, that is what I mean by the continuous um, a process that takes place in policy schools. The world continues to move forward. We have to interpret uh, what we're doing um, uh, uh, differently in face of the new facts that we see. Um, and uh, we have to have that continuous process of understanding. So I, I think it's very clear that that's what this school does, and I want to congratulate you on 90 years. Now, Jack has um, been the dean for a long time here, right, since 2005. Uh, and um, it's clear that um, under his leadership, he's taken the school in um, new directions and had a huge impact on the school. Um, it's, it, uh, we um, care a lot about um, uh, making sure that we have the resources available to us, and that's reflected in um, the school's $50 million endowment. It's, it's just very important that we have those resources and that they put, be put to good use to take us in directions that the way we spend them reflects our values and what we're doing. And it's clear you are doing great things. The Price School has risen um, up in the rankings so that US News now ranks you number three in public affairs schools nationwide. Now, all right, so everybody hates um, uh, the, the rankings, right? You know, I, I despise them. They drive very bad behavior. And it would be nice if one of your policies was to put US News out of work. Um, but, but in point of fact, these rankings are important that, that they do, I like to think of them as reflecting accomplishment, that, that um, there's a huge reputational piece in the rankings. And if you don't have a good reputation, if you aren't accomplishing, then you aren't recognized. As I said yesterday, um, I think of, of USC as elite. And the reason I think we're elite is not because of who we exclude. We actually are very inclusive. We're elite because of what the faculty accomplish, what the students accomplish, and what the alumni accomplish. And that you, you, you get designated into the elite status because of the great things that we have done that changed the world. Clearly, the Price School has. And um, I, I think that uh, Jack has done a lot 
want to continue to build on, um, I don't know, the previous 70 years of the, of the school's um, history and, and taken us um, uh, to new heights. So I, I, I don't know all of the faculty that we're um, celebrating here um, today. Um, uh, Tyree Banerjee, Terry Cooper, Martin Krieger, and Dan Masmanian. I do know Dan. Is Dan here? Yeah, there you go. So Dan is running the environmental task force that uh, President Fult has put together and um, with um, uh, uh, a, a, a tremendous capacity to organize a meeting and um, drive an agenda forward. I've really enjoyed working with him as um, progress, um, tremendous progress is being made and we're hopeful that that planning exercise will result actually in substantial substantial changes to how we think about sustainability on these on this campus how we do scholarship in the area how we um, uh, teach what we teach and how we actually um, operate the university in a more sustainable way um, so just in closing um, I'm between you and lunch um, and uh, for 90 years the price school of public policy really has earned the public trust and uh, because you come up with policy that, that and practices and thought processes that um, uh, result in improving our lives. And I like this concept of um, public service, that this is the place that we think about the society around us and put in place the practices that lead to um, a higher quality lifestyle for us all, higher to mitigate the disparities that we're seeing and improve lives for everyone. So congratulations to everyone here. I look forward to another 90 years. Thank you very much.